one thing I want to say before we get any further, because this is very confusing. This is where people get lost. We said earlier, we have a, something called the Frank Starling mechanism. When the preload goes up, that's going to stretch out your sarcomeres, right? And that's going to have myocardial stretch, sarcomere lengthening, increased velocity of contraction, stronger contractility, right? So if I increase preload, I increase contractility, right? So you might be saying, well, so how do you know which one of these curves, you know, you're talking about? Does this curve add on with this curve when you increase preload? In reality, yeah, that's that's what happens. But when we're looking at these curves, we're usually looking at isolated changes that are happening. Kind of like I told you with the venous return curves and the cardiac function curves, just focus on the disruption and, you know, we can work our way from there. So what I want you to do in this in this particular part of the video is just focus on the determinant. Don't worry about the fact that preload can also cause contractility or the fact that afterload can actually affect the preload. All of these different determinants can affect each other in different ways, but just focus on the primary determinant. Okay, with that being said, preload. So what's preload gonna do? This is the biggest thing. It's going to shift the end diastolic volume to the right. Now, how do you conceptualize that? Remember, preload is the venous return. If I'm increasing venous return to the heart, we already said preload is basically synonymous with end diastolic volume. If you've been watching these videos so far, this is just review, right? We've said this probably three or four times that the preload is synonymous with the end diastolic volume. It's the amount of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole. I'm gonna have more blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole if I have more blood return to the heart. It's that simple. So we're moving the curve to the right, particularly the end diastolic volume. Remember, end diastolic volume, and systolic volume. And systolic volume is not really changing with preload. Okay, this is the amount of blood injected from the heart. But the stroke volume increases because I'm increasing the end diastolic volume and stroke volume is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. Okay, so that's the concept, that's the preload. What about contractility? Well, if I have increases in contractility, it's going to shift my curve to the left. Okay, so why is that? It's shifting the curve to the left because as I increase contractility, what am I doing? I'm ejecting more blood from the heart, right? So I'm gonna push the curve further to the left. And what does that do? Remember, stroke volume is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume, okay? So it's lengthening this distance. So it's increasing the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart, okay? So it's gonna increase the stroke volume and that we do this again by decreasing the end systolic volume, the amount of blood left in the ventricle at the end of systole, it's decreased with increased contractility because I've ejected more of that blood out of the heart, okay? And the reverse is true. For lower preloads, you know, I'm gonna shift this to the left. For lower contractility, I'm gonna shift this to the right, okay? What about afterload? Now, afterload, I feel like is always the most complicated of the three. Um, so afterload, the first thing is, you know, remember the left ventricle has to pump against this resistance. If there's more resistance that it has to pump against, it can't pump as much blood. If there's less of a gradient of pressure for blood to travel, you're gonna get less of it traveling, right? And so if the aortic pressure is higher, or we have aortic stenosis, or we have vasoconstriction, these things will prevent more blood from leaving the ventricle, okay? And so the end systolic volume will shift right for that reason, less blood, is leaving the ventricle with increases in afterload, right? Less blood is gonna be leaving the ventricle. And overall, generally speaking, we'll see a decrease in the stroke volume, okay, for that reason, generally speaking. Now, the other thing is, you can see that, notice that in this particular curve, we've actually increased the height of the curve, okay? And that's because, remember, you're fighting a higher pressure leaving the left ventricle. If this is my left ventricle, and it's eventually gonna go into the aorta, okay, I'm just kind of, drawing this not anatomically, I'm just giving you an idea here from a physiologic perspective. What's happening is if the aorta has some stenosis somewhere or if there's vasoconstriction or a higher pressure, again, the concept is I'm gonna have less blood that's able to leave into the aorta because of the higher pressure, because of the stenosis, whatever it is. So that's gonna increase my end systolic volume. I'm gonna have more blood left behind. The other thing is I'm going to need a higher pressure to get the blood out of the left ventricle. If I have more force coming in here, right, to get through this uh, increased resistance, then I'm better able to get blood beyond that space. And so what happens is I need a higher pressure. Remember, what's on the y-axis here? 
left ventricular pressure. I need to get a higher pressure to exceed the aortic pressure to get the blood out. Okay, so that's why with increases in afterload, we're gonna see an increased height to the curve. So the two big things, we're gonna see an increase in height to the curve, and we're also going to see an increase in the end systolic volume for the reason we already mentioned. Okay, so to recap, increases in preload are gonna shift the uh, curve to the right. The end diastolic volume is gonna go to the right. And when I say shift to the right, I'm just talking about this. I'm not talking about the entire you know, a diagram here. We're just saying that the end diastolic volume is gonna go up. So the rightward border is gonna shift right. For increases in contractility, the left border of my curve is gonna to shift to the left, not the whole curve. The end diastolic volume didn't change. It's just the end systolic volume that's getting uh, to come down because I'm increasing my contractility. If I increase the afterload, I'm gonna get a curve that's gonna have a greater height and higher end systolic volume. Okay, and again, the reverse is true for these. So what about if I had lower levels of afterload? What would that curve look like? Take a second, pause the video, see if you can think about what would it look like if I had lower levels of afterload. So if I had a lower level of afterload, is my end diastolic volume gonna change? It's probably not. I'm gonna have a lower height from the lower afterload, right? And I'll probably have a curve that goes out somewhere like this. Okay, so if I lower the afterload, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna decrease my end diastolic volume. I'm gonna get more blood out, right? Because I have a lower pressure I'm fighting against. And not only that, but I won't need to generate as high of a pressure, okay? I won't need as high of a left ventricular pressure to get the aortic valve to open. Okay, so this is what it would look like if I lowered the afterload. Okay, so just really quickly, just to kind of go through this one more time, this was my pressure volume loop, and I know not all my lines are completely straight, but hopefully you guys get the idea here. So if I decrease the preload, it's gonna look something like this, right? I'm just moving my end diastolic volume to the left a little bit. I'm gonna have less filling, right? If I'm in hemorrhagic shock, my preload comes down, it's gonna shift it to the left. How about if my preload goes up? Okay, what about if my preload goes up? If my preload goes up, I'm gonna shift the curve where? To the right, okay? So that's what's gonna happen. And again, these are some classic examples, things that we've kind of already talked about. If I add fluids, increasing total blood volume. Hemorrhagic shock, I'm, I have low total blood volume. What about nitroglycerin? So nitroglycerin, remember, is primarily a venodilator, okay? So primarily a venodilator but it also can dilate some of the arteries. It has secondary effects. But the majority of the effects, we're just gonna say the majority of the effects are gonna be on the veins. So that's what you wanna remember. So the venous side, remember in the previous videos, we went through all of this, and the venous side, we're primarily talking about preload. In the ar arterial side, we're primarily talking about afterload. Okay, so if you organize it that way in your mind, it actually makes things a lot easier. So what's gonna happen when I give a patient nitroglycerin? What happens to my curve? Well, we just said it's primarily affecting preload. So we would expect something similar to what we saw with our blue curve here, where we have a lower end diastolic volume. But because it does have some effects on the afterload, we're slightly gonna lower the afterload. So it might look something like this, okay? Where overall, I'm gonna have a slight decrease in my afterload, Okay, so this, this uh, pressure that I need to generate to get blood out of the left ventricle is gonna be a little bit lower, and it's going to be a decrease in the end diastolic volume. And that's gonna cause an overall decrease in the stroke volume. So that's nitroglycerin. What about sodium nitroprusside? So remember, I said with nitroglycerin, it's primarily going to be a venodilator. What about sodium nitroprusside? So this is actually, think of this one as more like a 50-50. Okay, so it's going to do a little bit of both. Okay, so it's not necessarily one or the other, it's kind of both. So how would that differ from what we saw here with nitroglycerin? So it's going to have effects on preload, but it's also going to have effects on the afterload, much more effects than we saw with nitroglycerin. So we probably see a decrease in the end diastolic volume, right? And then we'd see a larger decrease in the afterload. And because we have such a big decrease in afterload, we might also see some decrease in the end systolic volume. Okay, so the end systolic volume is gonna be affected more because we're decreasing the afterload more significantly with sodium nitroprusside than with nitroglycerin. Okay, so we have a greater decrease in the afterload responsible for a decrease in end systolic volume, right? Less blood left over after the contraction because I have less afterload. And we're also gonna have a decrease in the end diastolic volume as well. And that's because I decrease the preload by dilating the veins. Okay, so you get multiple effects. You have to kind of just, once you understand the determinants, you can just apply them, plug them into these different situations. Now remember, I told you that the overall area of this loop is responsible for the ventricular work, which is proportional to myocardial oxygen demand. 
we give patients, remember, we give patients nitroglycerin. Why? Well, if, patient has, if a patient has angina, they're exceeding their myocardial work demands. Remember, I told you in the uh, previous video that my coronary, the coronary arteries extract so much oxygen that they have to dilate during periods of exercise. People that have atherosclerosis are going to have narrowed vessels at baseline. And so those vessels will have to dilate maximally in some situations just when the patient is walking. When the patient starts to exercise or performs increased activity, they get anginal pain because they're already maximally dilated at their coronary vessels. And so we give those patients nitroglycerin because the idea is we don't want the patient to have more myocardial work. We want less myocardial demand on the heart. And we do that by decreasing the preload primarily. This was my pressure volume loop, right? If I decrease the preload, what am I doing? If I decrease the preload, I decrease the area under the curve, less myocardial work demand. That's what nitroglycerin is doing, okay? So that's just taking all of the things we're talking about and just plugging it into one scenario. Okay, so contractility, just gonna go through this a little bit faster. Again, here's my curve. And if I give a patient uh, an agent that is going to increase contractility, what would I expect? Remember I told you that would be an increase in the amount of blood ejected from the heart. So it might look something like this. Okay, so I'm gonna get the major change is going to be a decrease in the end systolic volume. Okay, there might be a slight increase in the afterload. That's what I kind of drew here. A slight increase in the afterload. And the reason there might be a slight increase in the afterload is because of the increased pressure from that contractility. But overall, the big thing to remember is that you're gonna get a decrease in end systolic volume. Okay, what about afterload? So again, these are just the things that we've already talked about. So just to draw out the curve one more time. Okay, so here's my curve. Okay, so if I gave a patient phenylephrine, right, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna get an increase in the afterload. So my end diastolic volume is not changing, okay? And my curve is gonna look something like this. I've increased the pressure I need to get blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta, right? Because I have an increase in afterload from this phenylephrine, this alpha-1 agonist. So I increased my, uh, my height of my curve, and that's mostly primarily because of the afterload. And in doing so, less blood's going to get ejected from the left ventricle. And so I also have a decrease in the end systolic volume. Now, if I give a patient hydralazine, on the other hand, we'd have the opposite effect, right? This is a vasodilator. So you would get something more like this. And you'd have a decreased end systolic volume, uh, the peak systolic pressures uh, on the curve. Okay, so it's kind of the same concept of what we talked about. And remember, classic things that affect afterload are not just the arterioles. Remember, the aorta is a big factor. If you have aortic stenosis, aortic carotation, if in a surgery they clamp the aorta, all of those things are very classic for increasing your afterload.